Acadiana Center for the Arts in Lafayette. This is the Race for City Hall, sponsored by UL Lafayette, Acadiana Open Channel, One Acadiana, and KATC TV3. Good evening, everyone. I'm Jim Hummel, and welcome to the Acadiana Center for the Arts in downtown Lafayette. For the next hour, right here on KATC, we have a candidate forum in the race for Lafayette Mayor President. Join me in welcoming the candidates to the stage here at the ACA. We have Josh Guillory, Carlos Harvin, Nancy Marcotte, Simone Champagne, and Carly Amlabar. And as you can tell, we have a live audience here at a packed house here in the ACA for tonight's forum. I want to go over the ground rules first before we get started. For tonight's forum, the candidates have agreed to play Jeopardy. We have a Jeopardy-style forum for tonight, minus the points, the theme music, and you don't have to answer uh, in the form of a question. I guess if you wanted to, you could just overcomplicate <laughs> things here tonight. Let's not do that, shall we? Right. Yes. Uh, on our board tonight, we have five topics that we're going to be covering for tonight's forum. We have the budget, development and planning, infrastructure and public works, LUS, and then we've also put together a potpourri category of various topics that are of interest to the voters here in Lafayette. We're gonna have three rounds tonight. The candidates will each have a chance to select a question and then have one minute and 30 seconds to answer that question. Once a question has been selected, it's no longer in play. The next candidate will then select a new question from the board and have one minute and 30 seconds for their response and we'll go through the order here tonight. Uh, for tonight's forum, each candidate does have the option for one rebuttal and they will be allowed one minute to use that rebuttal. Uh, although if someone is directly challenged on stage tonight, we will give them an appropriate amount of time uh, to address any challenge that may come up from another candidate. There are two daily doubles on our board tonight and if those questions are selected, every candidate will have one minute to answer that question. Time permitting, we'll also have a lightning round. We have several questions that are quicker answers and then uh, each candidate will have a chance to answer each of those questions. Time permitting, we'll also have uh, some time for closing remarks. We've allotted 30 seconds uh, for that. Now the candidates have been given the topics ahead of time, but not the questions themselves. The order that we have the candidates on stage with us tonight was selected at random uh, before we started tonight's program. And now time for the candidates to introduce themselves to the voters. Everyone has one minute for opening remarks, starting with Mr. Josh Guillory. Well, Jim, thank you. Thank you to Juan Acadiana, and thank you to UL Lafayette, my alma mater, for putting on this uh, fantastic forum. I love our home, Lafayette. It's where I raise my children, where I run my practice, my business. I'm a small business owner. Uh, my wife and I absolutely love the culture here. I'm a practicing attorney in, in the community where I focus primarily on family law. I've served in a, a capacity that I really enjoy, which is a volunteer middle school football coach for many years. I'm a proud Army veteran, served in Iraq in 2005 as a cavalry officer. Should I be blessed to serve as our next mayor president, my priorities are very straightforward. Drainage, roads and traffic, bring jobs back to Lafayette and keep us safe. That's the pillars of government. That's the primary functions of government. If we do that, everything else will fall into place. So again, my name is Josh Guillory, and I humbly ask for your support. Thank you, Mr. Guillory. Mr. Harvin, you have one minute. Good evening, everybody, and thank you, Jim. Thank you, UL and Winnicadiana, for this wonderful time to get together. My name is Carlos Harvin, and I'm running for mayor president for Lafayette Parish. I once heard that there are three types of people in the world. There are those who make things happen, there are those who watch things happen, and there are those who ask what happened. I'm the type of person that does not stand by, and I live in a part of the city, it's got a nickname, I live on the north side. It's called Wine Alley, and I can give you a landmark. It's right behind the Walmart that just closed, and that's across the street from the Albertsons that just closed. It's down the street from the Taco Bell that just closed, and it's right around the corner from the Kentucky Fried Chicken that just closed, and it's down the street two days ago from Advanced Auto Parts, which closed, and the Convention Visitors Bureau, which also closed. I live on the side of town where everything is closing. The reason I'm running for mayor president is to let everybody know that the north side of Lafayette is open for business. Thank All you. right, thank you, Mr. Harvin. Ms. Marcotte. Thank you. Wow. 
sorry. Thanks. Thanks. First, I want to thank you, Elle, and I want to thank Juan Acadiana for hosting this event, and I want to thank the audience for watching. I am a lifelong Republican, I'm a pro-life mother, and I'm an entrepreneur. I grew up in Lafayette, and I love Lafayette. I went to school here, I went to public school here, I graduated from UL, I raised my family here, and I've opened my businesses here. This community is wonderful, and I want to let everyone know that I am the only candidate here that has opened multiple businesses, successful businesses, over the extended period of time, and I have a record of success, and I feel like I can make a difference in Lafayette, so I humbly ask for your vote. Thank you, Ms. Marcotte. Ms. Champagne, you have one minute. Good evening. Thank you, UL and Juan Acadiana, and thank you for being taking time out of your busy day to be with us tonight. We do appreciate it. My name is Simone Champagne. I had the unique opportunity. I worked in the uh, private sector for 26 years in a community-based bank. What that taught me is when customers come in and hand you their money, you have to be good stewards of that money. So going into government in 2002 as an administrator for parish government, I brought that with me. And I understood that the taxpayer money is your money. And we have to be good stewards of that money. I had the unique opportunity to run for the legislature in 2007 and serve two terms in the House of Representatives. In 2015, the Mayor, mayor Ritter of the city of Youngsville asked me to go to work for him in, as his chief administrative officer. And that's where I am today and very proud of that. So what I tell people is my priorities are the same as I'm sure everyone on this panel. Drainage is a must. Drainage, infrastructure, including roads, our, people don't like to talk about this, but sewer capacity. Right here inside uh, Lafayette, the city of Lafayette, we don't thank have any more Champagne. sewer capacity. So thank you and vote Simone Champagne. Thank you, Ms. Champagne. Ms. Omlabar, you have a minute. I'm Carly Omlabar, and I'm probably the most unlikely candidate on this stage. I'm an independent. I have a funny last name. I'm short. <laughs> I look like a little girl, and I've never run for office before. But I'm the only candidate who challenged an incumbent, and let me tell you why. Lafayette is at a crossroads. Thousands of homes flooded. Thousands of jobs lost. I'm 43 years old, and I've seen so many people leave Lafayette, and we cannot let that happen. More than anyone on this stage, I've been actively involved in economic development throughout various facets of my career. And that's part of why I have so many businesses who are supporting me. My supporters include Republicans, Democrats, and independents like me. And like you, they want results for our community, not empty political slogans. We don't have time for distractions. We all love Lafayette. On October 12th, please put me to work. All right, our thanks to the candidates for introducing themselves to the voters tonight. Let's get started. We provided you guys with, uh, y'all with stools, so if you want to take a seat, uh, get uh, seated before uh, we start tonight's Jeopardy forum. And uh, let's start with round one. Mr. Guillory, uh, you'll select first from the board. All right, let's go with the budget for Q1. All right, question one on the budget. Question one, and this is a daily double, so every candidate will have one minute uh, to answer this question. What is one opportunity within the city or parish budget for significant cost savings? Mr. Guillory, you have one minute. The single greatest, well, I don't want to say the single greatest, one of the most important aspects that we need to look at in the budget is our retirement system. Um, right now we're using MERS, which is the municipal, municipal retirement system. LCG pays 27.75% into that retirement. If we were to switch to what we had at one point, which is the parochial uh, retirement system, or PERS, LCG would pay 11.5%, which would save our, our local budget uh, a lot of money over the time. I think it's, uh, it's my understanding if we hire 100 people making $30,000 a year, we could save approximately $500,000 a year going forward. Now this wouldn't affect the current LCG employees. This would be for only new hires coming forward. So that's one aspect. But the bottom line is, with a budget from 600 to 700 million dollars a year, we have enough to pay for the priorities. We need to look at every single department. Any surpluses must go to drainage, must go to roads and traffic, and let's focus on the priorities. 
All right, same question. Mr. Harvin, one minute. I'd like to see us put less money into incarceration and more money into education. I'd love to see more funds going into helping students and youth with after-school programs. I think if we can get to young people on a preventive side, helping them with early childhood education, partnering with the Lafayette Parish School System, coming up with innovative prog projects, we can save so much money on what we're spending to incarcerate, and I think we need to put much more money where we educate. All right, Ms. Marcotte. I think that um, we, could, we have many opportunities within the city or parish budget for significant cost savings. And we need someone that has the business experience that I have to look at the budgets, to reallocate and, and reprioritize what the money is being spent on. And none of that will be done without the transparency and restoring our faith in government. That's one of my priorities. Uh, along with drainage and roads, we need, to, we need people to have our trust back in government, and I will implement the Louisiana checkbook so that taxpayers can see exactly where money is being spent every day. Thank you. Ms. John Pine. Thank you. Uh, we, the priorities are drainage infrastructure as well as public safety, fire, and police. And to accomplish that, I don't believe that we need more revenue. So what I'm going to look at first is all of the co uh, contracts throughout the city and the parish and making sure that these, contract, these contracts, the people are accountable and that they're actually doing the service that they were commanded to do. A reallocation of revenue is needed because we do have to set our priorities and we need to get back to the basics of government. And that means making sure that the taxpayer, which is you, is, is getting what they, they are paying for. So reallocation of funding along with uh, contract review, closer contract review, making sure everyone is accountable and we will find the revenue to make sure that we, uh, we can fund our critical services. Thank you, Ms. Almobar. In December of 2018, the voters uh, voted for charter amendments which were passed. And so the biggest opportunity that we have going into this new form of government in January 2020 is to take a close look at the, in particular, the parish budget. One of the unintended consequences of consolidation is that the parish government is paying for things that I think many of us in this room would agree and those watching at home are not necessarily core parish services. One of the great advantages of having a parish council is I'm going to work with them on identifying what those core parish services are and trimming. A quick example, I was the planning director for a couple of years and the codes inspectors who inspect homes in, in the unincorporated parts of the parish, the parish council may determine that they can pay for that on a case-by-case -case basis as opposed to paying a, a staffing salary. I'm ready to work with the parish council to do that. All right, thank you. That's for our first daily double, everybody. Let's continue with our round one questions. Mr. Harvin, the board is yours. I would like to go with infrastructure and public works, please. Question and which one. one? Question one. Question one in infrastructure and public works. If additional funding for drainage were identified, what types of projects do you believe would be the highest and best use of those funds? Great question, Jim, and that's why I'm running for mayor president. We need somebody who's going to be a visionary, somebody who's going to be a team player, and a leader who can work with other leaders. Lafayette is surrounded by Broussard, Karen Crow, Dusson, Scott, Milton, and Youngsville. And many of those jurisdictions have their own mayors and city councils. We have our own new mayor president come in. We're having a new five-member city council coming in, a, fi a new five-member parish council coming in. We're going to have to, there's a lot of moving parts there, but we're going to have to find out not only what's a priority in the city of Lafayette, but in each of those local jurisdictions. So I would work very closely with Ray Bork, the mayor of Broussard, because I know he's got a drainage project that's going to cost $1.1 million. Uh, I'm going to work closely with Mayor Brasso from Karen Crow because his drainage project, which is downtown Karen Crow, he wants to stop erosion. We will be a team player. I work very closely with the mayor of Youngsville, Ken Ritter. Ken Ritter has identified he wants new home construction in Youngsville, but he, before he does that, he wants to be able to prevent flooding there. I'm going to work very closely. He also, by the way, wants to look at the Shemin Metairie Road uh, 
uh, inter intersection. And um, I'm also going to be working with the town of uh, Dusong. They have a drainage project and $450,000 for sewer improvement. Also, the mayor of Scott, Jean Scott Richard, he has a drainage project of $2.4 million at the Cooley Ildecon. And that's going to take a lot of partnership and working together. All right, thank you. Uh, Ms. Marcotte, select a question. Sure. I'll take infrastructure and public works question two. All right, question two on infrastructure and public works. Will you commit to working with other parishes to address drainage as a regional issue? And how would you address potential pushback from other parishes on projects like dredging the Vermilion River? So I, I, I think this is also a very good question. And yes, I will commit to working with other parishes. I think that we need to work together with our parish leaders and set up a system so that our neighbors, our friends, and our families don't have to worry every time a major rain event is predicted. We need to work with Crot Springs that, that shuts off the pumps to, 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 uh, that fill the vermilion and keep the water flow going in the vermilion when it's, when it's dry. We need to shut those pumps off. We need to divert water. We need to do everything we can to clean out the Vermilion River. And I understand that Vermilion Parish does not um, necessarily want the water from up north to come through their parish. But I think that if we restore the Vermilion back to where it was, they're not gonna have any more water than, than they ever had. It's just gonna come a little bit faster. And that's where they need to, to understand. And I feel like I have what it takes business-wise to work with everybody, all the parish leaders, to solve those issues and to work with Vermilion. All right, thank you, Ms. Marcotte. Ms. Champagne, your turn to select from the board. Uh, I'll take infrastructure and pu public works, question three. All right, question three in that category. Should the city of Lafayette be investing more dollars in pedestrian and bicycle infrastructure? Why or why not? My answer would be no. Until we can fix the drainage problems and our basic needs of government, which is what our citizens should be expecting of us. Although I, I like pedestrian paths, I love bicycle paths, I believe that our community is better served in individual developments and allowing private sector to do these in their developments. So I feel that we need to address drainage, infrastructure, and we have to get back to those basics. And infrastructure is roads, sewer capacity, and those issues so we can expand our economy. If people feel safe in their homes and their businesses, they're gonna stay in those homes or those businesses. If they don't feel safe, they're gonna out-migrate. We cannot have that. It is an economic component of uh, our priorities. So by setting them and we, we go ahead and take care of those, that would be what I think is the needs of our residents and the taxpayers. So no, I would not uh, support those as first priority. All right. Thank you, Ms. Champagne. Ms. Amlabar, you're up to select from the board. Development and planning, question one. All right, development and planning. Question one, Plan Lafayette. Lafayette's comprehensive plan is in its fifth year and going through an amendment process right now. To what extent are you committed to Plan Lafayette's implementation? Absolutely committed. Uh, Plan Lafayette was an extensive effort done several years ago that gathered input from thousands of citizens about the future of our community. But taking it a higher level, as a community, we have to be planning. I can't tell you how many times, I think several times today, someone's, people have said to me, our roads don't make no sense. These things make no sense. In some cases, our drainage doesn't make sense. So in order to do that, we have to plan. 2014 Plan Lafayette was the first fully adopted comprehensive plan our community had ever had. So we have a lot of work to catch up to that we need to do. And so I think absolutely we need to continue Plan Lafayette. In addition, the infrastructure planning that is associated with this amendment is absolutely criti critical giving our, given our drainage needs, our transportation needs, and, and the sewer needs that Ms. Champagne suggested. 
All right, thank you, Ms. Amlabar. That's the end of round one. A reminder to the candidates that you do have uh, one minute rebuttal to use uh, throughout the course of the night. So just keep that in mind as we continue on playing. Uh, we're on to round two now. Uh, since Mr. Guillory, you went first in the first round, uh, Mr. Harvin, you're up first to select from the board. I was ready. You were ready, though. I saw that. <laughs> Could we do the budget question two? All right, the budget question two. In such a tax-adverse climate, under what conditions would you support a new city or parish tax and for what uses? I would support it if the voters support it. We just went through an, an exercise where our Lafayette Regional Airport needed expansion. That issue was put on the ballot on a referendum, and it passed unanimously raised more money than anticipated, and it got that funding in, short, in a much shorter amount of time than was anticipated. We've also seen amendments put on the ballot to expand our schools, which was voted down on the ballot. So I believe if the voters understand, and I, as a financial advisor in my training, what I've learned is that price is an issue only in the absence of value. If we value something big enough, important enough, we'll be willing to make that sacrifice. So I will support whatever the voters support. I'll rebut. All right, Mr. Giller, you have one minute for a rebuttal. Our budget, again, is 600 to 700 million dollars a year. We do not need to raise taxes. I view taxes like I view war. It is a necessary evil, but let that be the last resort. A lot, of our pro a lot of our priorities, drainage, roads and traffic, it's not just a local issue. If our local budget falls short, you won't find a better, or a stronger advocate than me to go to Baton Rouge and to go to Washington, D.C. to knock on the door of our legislators, to knock on the door of our congressmen, our senators, to find the additional funding. Again, our issues are not always local, but we have, we have the resources within our budget to identify our needs. And where we fall short, we don't need to rush to the taxpayers to ask for more money. Okay, thank you, Mr. Guillory. Moving on now, Ms. Marcotte, your turn to select a question. I will ask for potpourri question one. All right, the potpourri category question one. This is a daily double, so everyone will have a chance to respond. One minute for each candidate. What do you want to be known for when your term comes to an end? Ms. Marcotte. I would love to be known as a doer and somebody that got things done. We had, we've been waiting over 40 years for the I-49 connector. We've been waiting over 30 years for the Camellia Bridge to be built. That was finally built. But I want to be known as someone that came in and got things done and turned th this government around. I have what I like to call the Mar Marcotte priorities, and that's infrastructure that works, trust, restoring trust in government, and bringing jobs back. And I think that I have what it takes with my business experience to do that, and that's what I want to be known for. Thank you, Ms. Champagne. How about you? Thank you. I want to be <clears throat> known that I corrected the issues that we had at hand today, that at the end of the day, the people in Lafayette Parish are protected, that they feel safe in their homes, that they're not going to flood, that they're going to feel safe with fire and police protection, and that the whole time we did it, we did it with the tr bring back the trust of the people. And by doing that, I believe that uh, we will all benefit from looking at the critical e needs and looking at contracts and restore your trust. You know, I tell people every day, I don't blame people for not trusting government. We have given you a reason not to trust us. So at the end of the day, I want people to feel safe and I want to restore your trust in government. Ms. Amlabar. I think we're facing the challenge of our generation in addressing our drainage concerns. I talked to a, a friend the other day who said that when it rains, she watches her little girls pick their toys up off the ground because of their fear of getting flooded again. And we have people all over our community that are, if they're not literally picking up their toys, they're doing the adult equivalent of that when it rains. And so I want to be known as the mayor president 
who addressed our drainage concerns and brought our community together to solve those problems. But I want to do so in a way that reflects the other things that our community wants. We want to be a transparent, communicative government. We want to be talking to one another. We want to continue to be business friendly and grow as a community. So it's an opportunity if we come together to solve the challenge of our de generation to do all the other things that we want for Lafayette. Mr. Giller. I share in my fellow candidates in our desire to bring back trust to our local government. If all levels, if any level of government that we should have the most trust, it should be our local government. I want to bring back transparency. I want to bring back communication and partnership with our private sector. But above all, please let my administration be known as the administration that reigned in the government. Government has a very, very, very primal role in, in, our, in our daily lives. Bring back jobs, focus on infrastructure, and keep us safe. If we do that, if we can do that, everything else will fall into place. That's what, that's what my administration will be known for, and with your trust, we can do it. All right, thank you, Mr. Guillory. And Mr. Harvin, what would you like to be known for? When my term comes to an end, there's three things. I want to be known as the mayor who fixed the front door. That's the I-10, I-49 exchange. More traffic goes east and west on I-10. More traffic goes north and south on I-49 than probably anywhere else in the state of Louisiana, which is why we're called the Hub City. I would love to see a hospital right there on the north side at I-10 and I-49. I would love to see the Northgate Mall with a second floor, what Drew Brees is doing, a family entertainment center, residential, retail, and 5.5 miles of development from I-10 to Lafayette Regional Airport. 500 feet on both sides of the Evangeline Corridor, revitalized, brought back to life, a renaissance. I'd also like to be known uh, as the mayor that brought five to 10,000 new residents who came to live. No, we don't need to raise property taxes. We just need to raise the amount of people who are paying the property tax just by attracting people who want to live here. This has to be a beautiful city. It has to be an attractive city, a vibrant city, a city that's open for business. Right, and finally, you restoring a unity of purpose. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Harvin. Uh, continuing on with round two now, uh, Ms. Champagne, it's your turn to select from the board tonight. Pick a question. I'll take the budget question three. All right, the budget question three. Should LCG be providing more funding for the parish jail as the sheriff has requested? Very good question, thank you. The, the jail, the, we are mandated, the parish government is mandated to pay certain expenses throughout government, not only the jail, but the sheriff's department, our clerk of court, our uh, DA's office, we are mandated to pay those. I do believe if the, if the sheriff has critical needs and it's gonna protect the people, that he should be allowed to utilize that money. However, it does mean, and I'm sure that the sheriff would do this, is making sure that everything that is being spent, that you're accountable for it. So my answer is yes, we're mandated to pay cost, and we're mandated to pay their expenses, and, if the, and I would sit with the sheriff and we would go through that and make sure that everything is accounted for, and I trust that. All right, thank you, Ms. Champagne. Ms. Amlabar, your turn to select from the board. Pick a question, please. LUS, question one. All right, LUS, question number one. Would you consider privatization as an option for the future of LUS? Why or why not? No, we heard loud and clear from our community a year ago that that is not what our citizens wanted. LUS has long been a tool of our economic development as a community. It brought us lights in the 1890s. It brought us fiber in 2005. As we go into the future, we absolutely have to use LUS as a tool to continue to grow our economy. Many people don't know LUS funds our general fund, our city general fund, to the tune of about $24 million, and it's a critical resource in paying our first responders salaries. So I think it's very important that we continue to utilize LUS as our city's biggest asset to help continue to grow our economy into the future. All right, thank you. And Mr. Guillory, you're the last one up for round two. Let's go with development and planning Q2. All right, developing, development and planning for question number two. What steps can LCG take to promote reinvestment in disinvested parts of the city and parish, particularly the north side of Lafayette? The first thing we need to do is make Lafayette 
more inviting, not just for families to come back, as, as Carlos had mentioned, and I agree with you on that, um, but also businesses. One of the areas that, that, that's preventing this growth is our UDC. You know, the Uniform De uh, Unified Development Code, while we need regulations, we don't have to have them so strenuous. We don't have to, have it, we don't have to paint with such a broad brush. There, need to be, there needs to be variances. Broussard, you mentioned, Carlos, also has a, does a great job on their permitting process, for example. A lot of times, it's a, it's a one-stop shop. Well, right down the street, Lafayette, there shouldn't be a three or four step uh, process to get your permitting. We have to make our regulations more inviting. We have to make Lafayette more inviting. As our mayor president, I will do everything that I possibly can, not only for regulations to be more um, friendly to our businesses that we have and, and businesses that we can recruit, but also our infrastructure. We can't ignore that. You know, if you're a business and, and you're outside of our state or outside of our city and our parish and you're looking at Lafayette and you get, off the, you get out the airport or you drive into our city, you see grass overgrown. You see our education suffering. You see our roads and our traffic being ignored. You see drainage problems. These are the pillars of government. And this is, this is what I'm going to focus on. Trim the fat, focus on the issues, focus on the priorities. Again, everything else will fall into place. Let's make Lafayette more inviting for businesses to come and open shop. All right. Thank you, Mr. Guillory. And that's round two. Let's move on to round three. Ms. Marcotte, you're first up to select from the board. Okay. I will take potpourri again. Question two. All right. Popery, question number two, what is the largest challenge you anticipate with the implementation of the City Parish Charter Amendment, and how would you resolve it? Very good question. I think the largest challenge is that the monies have not been totally decided about what is parish and what is city and what is overlapping. The parish funds are the parish funds, the city funds are the city funds, but there are many areas that are overlapping and we need to separate them or get the city and parish to work together and that's basically what I would do to resolve it. I would get the city and parish councils together once a month at least to resolve those issues and work together because there is um, there is an overlap of some of the areas that that they need to work on. All right. Thank you, Ms. Marcotte. Ms. Champagne, you can select from the board. I will take potpourri question three. All right. Question three, given data that shows automated traffic enforcement, such as red light cameras, improves public safety, would you support reinstituting these type of measures? No, I wouldn't. I think it's an infringement on, uh, of people's rights for this. I did not support it when I was in the legislature, and I would not support it again. Okay. And a reminder, candidates, we all have, uh, most of us still have a rebuttal if you would like to use at any point during this final round. Ms. Amlabar, you're up next. Development and planning, question three. All right. Recognizing the cultural economy as one of Lafayette's strengths and opportunities, would you support continued funding of the CREATE initiative? Why or why not? Lafayette's cultural economy has long been a really important part of who we are and what makes people come here. I love Lafayette and I love our culture so much. I think many of our voters were very upset with how drainage and the CREATE initiative we're linked together. And so I think we have to rebuild trust and have conversations with our community about how we want to invest as a community in the cultural economy. And so I would be committed to working together with the, the citizens to determine how we will continue in, to invest in our cultural economy as a community. All right, thank you, Ms. Amlabar. Mr. Guillory, you're up to select from the board. Pick a question. LUS, Q2. All right. LUS, question number two. Do you believe LUS should prioritize more sustainable electrical power sources, even if it would increase costs for customers? 
I think LUS should focus on buying energy and buying power at a lower cost, whatever that looks like, so that we can pass on those costs to businesses. We have several hospitals that, would, that I've met with leadership in that I know would benefit from that. When we have these costs that are passed on to the private sector, they can reinvest into our economy, they can hire more individuals. This is the kind of ideas that we need to look at, both in LUS and anything in LCG. Let's think outside the box. Let's create jobs. Part of making it friendly to, to come and invest your, your company in Lafayette, it's not just with the UDC, but it's, it's, a, it's a bottom line issue. So LUS, if we can find ways to buy our cost energy and uh, our energy at a lower uh, price and pass that on to the consumer, count me in and I will sound the charge and lead the charge in doing that. All right, very good. Thank you, Mr. Guillory. And Mr. Harvin, your turn to select from the board. Let's see. <laughs> Which one's it going to be? Go <laughs> question number three, LUS. Are you sure? Final Hard answer? Choice. Hard choice. Okay, final, final answer. answer. <laughs> question number three, should extra public funding be dedicated to expedite sewer upgrades in the urban core which are needed to support development? Absolutely. I had a wonderful meeting with Anita Begno and the Downtown Development Authority team. Downtown is at the core of the city and this, this parish. And it's vital. There's a lot of potential for further growth, but there's some antiquated uh, systems, the sewage and water systems. We need lift stations there. There are, are, are if we were able to find more cost-effective ways of upgrading uh, the uh, public funding for sewage and water, uh, I think we would see much more investment uh, in the downtown area. It would attract more business to the downtown area. I, th I would definitely support uh, more funding for that. All right. And that's everyone's last chance to use a rebuttal. If anybody else wants to weigh in on that question, feel free. I did, did have a rebuttal for um, LUS, for affordable. I think it was uh, Josh's question. I'll, I'll allow it, sure. Thank you. Thank okay, you. anytime. <laughs> All for saving money. What would you money. like to say? And I think if we can move away from coal-powered uh, electricity production, and we look at more renewable forms of energy, just transporting the coal to those power plants costs the residents and citizens and voters of Lafayette tremendous amounts of money. I think there are some cost alternative ways that we can look at natural production or more cost effective ways of producing our electricity. All right, very good. Anybody else have anything they wanted to use their rebuttal for? Okay. That ends our first three rounds, everybody. We're gonna move on to a lightning round portion. So quicker answers, uh, since uh, some of us didn't use uh, the rebuttals, you might be able to take a little bit more time. We'll allow it for that, but uh, let's try to keep them at around uh, 30 seconds if possible. Uh, for the lightning round, uh, Ms. Champagne, you're going to uh, be up first. So our first question in the lightning round is, should we limit the number of elections to increase voter turnout, yes or no? Yes, and they should all be on major election cycles. I do not believe that we should allow elections mm -hmm. uh, on off cycles when it's for critical things such as taxes, new taxes. So yes, I do believe we should limit the number of elections and we should try and increase voter turnout, but I b believe by not putting tax measures on, uh, on the ballot, mm -hmm that we could, we could decrease this. I think a lot of people use this to try and increase a tax. Ms. Almobar? The number of elections are already limited by state law, and so I view my responsibility as mayor president to take the limited number of elections that we do have and engage the citizens as much as possible to increase knowledge and awareness about what's on the ballot and make sure that people are educated to vote. Mr. Guillory? Absolutely, 100%. Yes. You know, it, the voters are tired of this. You know, we put, take Fix the Charter, for example. We put that on the December ballot when it should have been on the November ballot last year. I'm tired. I know I'm fed up with, with these elections for taxes, like Simone said, or, or major controversial issues on these runoff ballots or these low, expected low turnout uh, elections. Let's put it on the ballot where we know that we're going to have the highest turnout available. Mr. Harvin. Uh, yes, I would limit the number of elections to increase that voter turnout. And I'm glad Election Day is October the 12th, which is a Saturday. Mm -hmm. So I would encourage everyone to vote for 93. Carlos Harvin for mayor president. <laughs> Thank you. I rebut. <laughs> and, and Ms. Marcotte, your thoughts on that? So my thoughts on are, are to say no. Um, I would not limit it because, as um, Carly had said, they are state mandated. 
but I would use it as an opportunity to educate voters and not increase our taxes and not uh, trick our uh, voters and our citizens into a low turnout. They need transparency and they need to be educated. All right, moving on. Our second question in the lightning round. Ms. Champagne, you're up first again because uh, you fell on this category for the lightning round. Um, should there be uh, more early voting locations throughout the parish to increase voter turnout, yes or no? Most definitely. Uh, it is very hard, we all know, to get to the courthouse. That's only our voter uh, poll with our early voting. So I do believe that we should work with all of our municipalities and do some satellite locations. I think this will increase our voter turnout for early voting and help in our issues. Ms. Almobar, your thoughts? I would absolutely support more locations for early voting. As I said before, I think engaging people is so important. In the charter example, a charter example, for example, we had more than 24% turnout because we worked hard to get that. And so it's our responsibility to increase as many options for voters. Now, certainly with the parish budget, we also need to keep that in mind as we try to do that. Mr. Guillory? Yes, and I agree that at minimum, we should have stations at, at each municipality. Okay. Mr. Harbin. Absolutely. I uh, was raised by two parents who taught us the importance of voting. People died mm -hmm. for us to have the right to vote. And there are people, and I've come from a community that was deprived and denied that right for a long time. Mm -hmm. So voting is something that every American should exercise. We should do everything to fight voter suppression, but we need to increase places where people can cast their ballot. On the election day, everyone is equal. Everyone has the power, one voice, one vote. All right, thank you very much. My, my answer is simple. Yeah. It's no. I mean, yes. I mean, yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> Just to remind you of the question there, yeah. <laughs> there should be more early voting uh, uh, locations throughout the parish. All right, by the way, early voting starts September 28th. Ms. Champagne, what is the top road improvement project you would fund, and please name a specific project? It would, well, the parish is not going to fund this, but mm -hmm. the I-49 corridor, I mm -hmm. think is the most, is the top road improvement project that we have in Lafayette Parish. Of course, we could utilize parish dollars to help the uniqueness of that corridor but I will work with our I-49 task force out of Baton Rouge, and hopefully we can push them a little bit further. I do know that they are uh, looking at buy the buyouts right now, mm -hmm. so we do see it coming, but I would, I would desperately urge them to continue that project. Ms. Alma do you have any ideas? While we wait for the billion dollar I-49 connector, as a city and as a parish, we have a responsibility to invest in upgrades in the Evangeline Thruway for several reasons. The north side needs investment, of course, and those of us that travel on the Evangeline Thruway know what a challenge it is, both from a transportation perspective and a gateway into our community. So that would be my top priority. Mr. Guillory, what are your thoughts? What project would you pick? Also, this would take partnership with our federal representatives, but an I-10 service road. Look what it did for Scott. Look what Louisiana Avenue, the target on that project, did for, for our city. I-10 service road would bring back jobs, but I want you to have confidence in, in my administration. I will work with both the parish council and the city council to make a list of roads from worst to first, and we will start at the top. And those, my friends in, in the Karen Crow area and Jolie Road, I have not forgotten about you. <laughs> Mr. Harvin? The ECI, the Evangeline Corridor Initiative. A black U.S. Senator named Cory Booker, Democrat. A black Republican Senator from South Carolina, Tim Scott. And a, Demo uh, and a Republican President, Donald Trump, got together on a tax cut bill and came up with Opportunity Zones. I think that there is funding available in the capital stack that we could get the Evangeline Corridor back on track. Ms. Marcotte. I would work on the uh, university um, coming from I-10 to our university. All right, very good. Uh, question number four, the Lafayette Public Library System we want to talk about next. Is it underfunded, overfunded, or funded appropriately? Ms. Champagne, what are your thoughts? I get four in a row. 
<laughs> it kind of fell on the lightning round. I can, I can cycle through, though, if you'd like. Would you prefer that? No, I'm teasing you. Okay. I'm teasing you. Uh, and I'm glad to answer this in verse. Mm -hmm. I believe they are overfunded. I believe that we should look at reallocation of funding into other areas. I do support our libraries. We have wonderful libraries right now. They will continue to be funded. I am opposed to building new libraries. So I do believe they are overfunded. If they can find $15 million to new, build a new library, they are overfunded. Ms. Amlabar? I believe that probably about a year ago they, they were overfunded and we have the opportunity on the October ballot to dedicate $8 million to drainage from libraries. But we also need to remember that the library system lost a millage about a year and a half ago. And so the library is still dealing with their new normal from an operating perspective. And I believe while, while they get, in, get used to that, we need to understand their expenses and revenues before we understand whether or not they, they remain underfunded. Mr. Guillory. Well, they are overfunded, but let me tell you, I support our library system. I want a vibrant library system, but I learned a while back, back in seventh grade, Stephanie Williams, my English teacher, told me, quantity does not equal quality. My brother manages one of our, our branches in, in the library system. It is overfunded. Let's use the money. Let's reallocate and get back to the primary functions of government. Let's fix drains. Let's fix roads. Let's bring jobs back, and let's keep us safe. Mr. I Harvey. think our, our libraries are funded appropriately. Uh, libraries are, are places, meeting places for the community. It's also a place that will close the digital divide. I'm so glad that we're going to get a brand new library, state of the art, in the northeast part of our city, so that we can get children who did not have the opportunity to get early childhood education, low literacy. Prison cells are built based on the number of young black boys who cannot read by third grade. That's how they determine how, that's the school to prison pipeline. Mm -hmm. Libraries are very important with cutting that pipeline off once and for all. Yeah. And Ms. Marcotte. Well, I understand that there's both sides of the issues and libraries do very good work for very, uh, very needy people and very wealthy people. They do good work all together. And I appreciate that our libraries have um, managed their money so well, but I don't believe that they need any more funding at the moment when our neighbors and friends and families are, are flooding. Very good. We're about halfway through our lightning round, so Ms. Champagne, I think I'll let you take the questions last for a, a few of these here. We'll Thank kind you. of cycle through uh, the rest I, I was here, good so. with taking first. <laughs> it's all good. Uh, Ms. Almobar, I'll start with you for this uh, question. Um, other than drainage, what is one city or parish priority that LCG is currently underfunding, in your opinion? I think we have a couple, but I'll, I'll name the parish courthouse and jail complex. I think those folks that that work in the jail and the parish courthouse understand that we have a lot of issues to look at there. We have a lot of opportunities as to how we can find funds to do that, but certainly I think folks who spend their time in that area understand we need some help. Mr. Guillory, your thoughts? Again, I want to reiterate drainage is the number one issue, uh, but second is infrastructure. We have our, our parking garage not too far from here, Buchanan Street parking garage that we need to look at, roads. Uh, we can't forget that. Again, we want to make it inviting for, for companies to come into to Lafayette. Mr. Harvin? I think inclusionary housing. I would love to see mixed income development all throughout Lafayette Parish so that regardless of your income, you're working a full-time job, you should be able to have the American dream. And sometimes that's going to be creative ways of financing mixed income housing developments that will give everyone, everyone a chance to fulfill that dream. Ms. Marcotte. So I would say the number one priority that is, is currently underfunded other than drainage is our roads in our public works department. And I would reallocate so that we would have more people that could fix our roads and fix our drainage, uh, the funds, reallocate funds. Okay. And Ms. Champagne? I would say our sewer needs uh, along university and downtown mm -hmm. as an economic component. I do believe that that is underfunded and we need to set it as a priority. Uh, we're mandated by DEQ to do this. So I don't want to see us get in trouble anytime soon, but it's, a, it's an economic engine for us. 
All right, very good. For the next question, Mr. Guillory, I'll have you take this yeah. one first. Uh, should the mayor-president position be split into a separate city of Lafayette mayor and a Lafayette parish president? Yes, and I will advocate for us to have a parish president and a city mayor. I believe it's important. I believe it helps us to breach a conflict of interest, a natural conflict of interest in what this new government will bring to us. And, and I may be the only person in America running on the platform of taking take power away from me, but I believe it's important. I believe we get better representation from that. Mr. Harvin, what do you think? Actually, Josh, you may be the second. Second. Okay. I would agree with that also. <laughs> two for two, huh? I went yeah, first. <laughs> there are so many moving parts to focus on as a mayor of a city. And then as a president of a parish, I don't think it does justice to the needs of both city and parish to have all of those duties just combined in one position. At some point, just as we split the city council from the parish council, I think we should split the role of mayor from the, that of parish president. Mm -hmm. Ms. Marcotte? I um, agree with Josh and Mr. Harvin. I think that the answer is yes, and I would also uh, be in favor of uh, relinquishing one of those roles in the future. Okay. Ms. Champagne, what do you think? Yes, I would agree with uh, the city of Lafayette having their own mayor. I don't believe that we ever really consolidated government as how consolidated government should be. The only thing that happened was the city of Lafayette lost their mayor. So yes, I would support it. All right. And Ms. Amlabar? Yes, but I think we need to be really practical about what that means for our community. I think it's largely a, an unworkable situation and would, would likely start the conversation around deconsolidation again because I want you to think about what it means to administer one government. If there are two executives administering consolidated government, two public works departments, two parks and recreation departments, my job as mayor president is going to be to run one government. If our community wants to work towards one mayor and a parish president, then we need to have restart the conversation of deconsolidation. All right, very good, everybody. Uh, and our final lightning round question, question number seven, term limits for the mayor president position, are they a good thing or a bad thing? I believe, Mr. Harvin, I'm starting with you this round. I think it's a good thing. I think it's great to get new ideas, fresh energy, fresh vision. And if you know that there's somebody that can uh, cause you to compete better, that helps to bring uh, competition for you to do the best that you can during the time that you have. Ms. Marcotte, what are your thoughts on term limits? My thoughts on term limits are that it is a good thing and that we need fresh ideas and uh, everything that Mr. Harvin said. <laughs> Ms. Champagne? I completely agree with term limits. If anyone followed my career in the legislature, I actually had term limit bills almost every year that I was there. As a matter of fact, the first year I wanted to ter term limit every elected official in the state. Well, that didn't work out. but. Uh, Yes, I think term limits are good. It offers new, new blood, new ideas. I'm completely in support of term limits. Ms. Amlabar. I'm also in support of term limits. In Lafayette, we have three terms, 12 years for elected officials, and that's a great amount of time to make an excellent impact in your community if you're so fortunate to be elected three times, but also an opportunity to make sure that we continue to have breathe new life and blood into our community. And Mr. Guillory. I wholeheartedly support term limits. All right, very good. All right, thank you, everybody. That is our lightning round questions. Um, let's get started on closing remarks. Uh, we have a little bit more time, so uh, maybe about 45 seconds, if we can, on the timer for each uh, candidate. Uh, Ms. Amlabar, I'll start first with you all the way at the end. You've been down there uh, tonight, so uh, let's have you start off with your uh, closing uh, statements to the voters tonight. Sure. First, I want to thank everyone who was a part of making tonight possible, all the hosts, etc., all of you in the audience and all the viewers watching at home. When I decided to run for, for this position, we put together a slogan that just said, vision, leadership, and results. And that's why I'm asking to be your mayor president. I have the vision for the job. I have a long track record of leading groups of people with diverse interests towards common goals. And I have a track record of achieving results on behalf of our community. And so I would be honored and humbled to serve as your mayor president. And I ask for your vote on October 12th. All right. Thank you, Ms. Amlabar. Mr. Guillory, you're up. All right. I would be honored, again, I would truly be honored to serve as our next mayor president. We all bring with us experience. I have very little experience with government. 
The only experience I have is serving in the Army and paying taxes. But I do bring the experience of a business owner and a combat veteran. And I've had to make decisions on the, on, on the fly, nanosecond decisions, and I've had to take my time in making some decisions. Just know this, every decision that I do make as your Mayor President, please know that I know where my heart is, and everything that I do, I will do with a thousand percent of my being to serve as a fiduciary on your behalf. I will never forget that the government is here to serve us, the, the, the public, us, the people, not the other way around. Mm -hmm. Mr. Harvin. I'm the second oldest of six children. I was born in Washington, D.C., raised as a Catholic. And in my senior year of high school in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, I got a calling to the priesthood. I went into St. John Vianney College Seminary where I got my Bachelor of Arts degree in philosophy. Went on to uh, St. Vincent de Paul Seminary in Boynton Beach and then on to Catholic University in Washington, D.C. After six years of seminary, I knew that my seventh year I would have to make a lifelong decision to be a celibate Catholic priest. And there was another part of me that also wanted to be married, so I didn't think that was going to work out very good. <laughs> so I made the decision to leave. But after having left the seminary and taught at a Catholic high school religion, I understood the importance of a calling. And the reason, and people, several people Thank have you, asked Mr. me, Thank you, Mr. Harvin. Why did you time. get in the race? I answered the call. Thank you, Mr. Harvin, appreciate it. Ms. Marcotte. Hi. Thank you again for being here and for watching. I am running for mayor president because I love Lafayette. And I feel like Lafayette can do so much better and all that's needed is strong leadership. I have that leadership. I have the record of success and I can get things done. I am not a politician. I'm not a career bureaucrat and I own businesses, businesses that employ a thousand people currently. I am the only candidate that can do the things that this city needs. So I would ask for your vote and your support. Thank you. And Ms. Champagne. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. I truly appreciate it. I'm very proud of the fact that I'm a public servant, not a past elected official or a bureaucrat, but a public servant. I am the oldest, I think, candidate on this uh, stage tonight, and I'm very proud of that. But it, it means that I believe in this election, we need a true leader that can make some bold moves. We have a lot of problems. It will take someone to get on the job, not on January 1st, but on the job on November 17th, if this goes to a runoff. I have the experience that I can hit the ground running. This cannot be an on-the-job training for the next uh, four years. So I humbly ask for your support and your vote on October 12th. All right, thank you, Ms. Champagne. Thank you to the candidates, and thank you to everybody who made this forum possible. One Acadiana, KETC, AOC Community Media, the ACA, and UL's College of Liberal Arts. Don't forget to get out and vote, everybody. October 12th, and early voting starts on September 28th. Thank you so much to everybody watching at home. Have a great night. <laughs>